Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India How are you doing with poetry so far? This lecture will discuss neoclassical and pre-romantic poetry in general and then in the subsequent lectures we will discuss the poets like Dryden, Pope, Gray, Collins, Blake. To begin with we will understand the whole scenario of this neoclassical period from 1600 to 1798 which we can divide into three distinct stages for convenience. Although we must be aware of the fact that there are problems with terms like restoration, neoclassicism uh, and pre-romanticism. Restoration starts in 1600 and ends with the death of uh, Dryden in 1700. Here we have two major poets like Rochester and Dryden. The neoclassical period begins from 1700 and ends around 1740. We have two dominant figures like Pope and Dr. Johnson and the next one is pre-romantic period from 1740 to 1798. Actually this is called the age of sensibility and even age of Johnson but we would like to give prominence to Gray and Collins and other pre-romantic poets although this term pre-romantic is uh, problematic. <coughs> we will look into their features, certain poets and their poems and some samples also we will read to understand the difference among these three stages of what is known as neoclassical period in English literature. We will also have at the end a tabular comparison among all these three. Let us begin with the historical context that means lot of political events that took place during this period. As we observed earlier this is a vast period from the political restoration in 1600 and ends around the poetic revolution that happened in 1798 with the publication of lyrical ballads by William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. During this period we have these political happenings. First we notice this restoration of monarchy in England with the arrival of King Charles II as the King of England. Then we have certain social events like the Great Plague in 1665 and the Great Fire in 1666 and also uh, a kind of rumored popish plot to create problems in society particularly to remove the king that is in 1678. <coughs> we also have the ascension of James II in 1685 and his abdication in 1688. Because of this glorious revolution which brought William III and Mary II in 1689 to be the king and queen of England. We have an act of settlement to solve the problem of who would become the king, next king after William the third and Mary the second. We have next to Queen Anne's period from 1702 to 1714. In this period we have an act which unites the three uh, areas in England that is uh, England, Scotland and Wales. In 1707 with this act of union England becomes United Kingdom and we have the first king of United Kingdom from King George I, 1714 to 1727. Next we have King George II from 1727 to 1760, which runs into our third period that is pre-romantic period with King George III and whose period starts from 1760 and ends in 1820 well into the romantic period. In between we have the American revolution promoting the idea of liberty independence from England. We have this idea of French revolution 
uh, from 1789 to 1799 promoting the principles of liberty, equality and fraternity. We also have to look into the literary context because of this restoration of monarchy we have reopening of theatre in 1660. We also have along with this influence of French culture in uh, English society. During this period we notice the predominance of satire and along with that the form of heroic couplet that is the rhymed iambic pentameter. In addition we have the rise of the periodical essay and also the novel form and during the same period we have number of diaries and travel writings by various writers. Similarly, it is in this period we find developments in literary criticism and practice particularly with the writings of Dryden and Johnson. We also have their reflective gloomy rural and natural subjects taken by some poets like Thomas uh, Gray, William Collins to deal with a new kind of awareness of life in this uh, period. And along with this we have the gothic novel obsession with the terror and the kind of uh, strange phenomenon in life. Now we will examine this restoration period. This is the period that brought King Charles II to England. Along with him it brought this French culture plus a notoriously distinct characteristic of this period that is a licentious and witty courtly atmosphere. Theatres were reopened and this time we have a kind of restriction of class identity. This was primarily open to upper class people and in this courtly atmosphere restoration theatre comedy of manners was much more prominent and this was the order of the day. The best example of this comedy of manners we have is from William Congrave whose the way of the world is a play, a play, a sexual play, an economic play, a psychological play, a play in every sense with that licentiousness together. We have John Dryden, a poet, dramatist, critic practicing various forms of literary art prose, poetry, criticism, drama and many other kinds like diary, religious tracts, political satire, everything flourished during this restoration period. There are certain features of restoration poetry which we need to understand for appreciating Dryden, the poet we have chosen for representing this period. Although this period is called restoration, it is actually a continuation of the renaissance in the sense of this continuation of classical revival from right from Ben Jonson. In this period we have a peculiar preoccupation with the contemporary events and particularly topical events. The poets and writers were becoming more self conscious about their participation in the making of history and also making what is great, what is canonical literature. And this period is marked by this concept called heroic sublime this heroic sublime is otherwise known as mock sublime. This is not the sublime of Longinus, it is a sublime of Horace and this period is marked by grand and impressive style which we can see in Milton's paradise last as well. We also have scholarly allusions, mythological references and the main motive is to correct the vices in society. A number of poets we can see in this period. Edmund Waller from 1606 to 1687 used heroic couplet. He published a number of poems. In fact, he was more popular than Milton in his own lifetime. Then we have John Milton and Andrew Marvell, but we do not bring them under this umbrella of restoration poetry, although they were part of the whole scenario. Samuel Butler was another poet known for this hoodie brass, a satirical poem, a satirical poem which attacked the protestants and non-conformists of this period. He was a royalist actually. Then we have John Wilmot often called the Earl of Rochester. He was a notorious wit 
and he was writing satiric poetry in English. He was the typical rake and rogue of this period. At the end of his life, he regretted that he lived an uncontrolled self-indulgent life. Then we have John Oldham. He is considered to be a pioneer of the imitation of classical satire. And these two writers were actually the contemporaries of John Dryden, who was able to pick up that tradition of heroic couplet from Edmund Waller, passed on to him uh, by Wilmot Wolham, and he was able to establish heroic couplet as the most suitable form of literature of this period. And so, Dryden is considered a precursor to the Augustan mode of literature. We have a number of poems which are representative of restoration poetry. First, we have Edmund Waller's poem, To the King on his Navy. Next, we have John Wilmot, that is Rochester's poem, A Satire Against Reason and Mankind. Third, we have Samuel Butler's poem, The Elephant on the Moon. The title itself is indicative of the kind of uh, inventive mind that this period had. Then we have Oldham, whose again long title is indicative of the spirit of the age. A satire upon a woman who by her falsehood and scorn was the death of my friend. Lastly, we have John Dryden, whose poem MacFlecno we will study in this course. Dryden is also known for his satirical poem Absalom and Akitafel. MacFlecno is a personal satire, whereas Absalom and Akitafel is a political satire. We have a sample poem for this period from Edmund Waller. His poem is To the King on His Navy. These are the opening lines, the idea I have taken from Kaminsky, so the reference is there. And also, the reference will be useful for us to understand how Edmund Waller contributed to heroic couplet in English poetry. Wherever thy navy spreads her canvas wings, homage to thee and peace to all, she brings the French and Spaniard. When thy flags appear, forget their hatred and consent to fear. So Joe from Ida did both host survey, and when he pleased to thunder, part the fray, ships heretofore in seas like fishes sped, the mightiest still upon the smallest fed, thou on the deep imposest nobler laws and by the justice has removed the cause of those rude tempests which for rapine sent too of alas involved the innocent. It is about the expansion of the sea through this naval power of England. Next discuss this neoclassical idea. This is a central part of this neoclassical period first restoration then neoclassical and the third pre-romantic period. This is roughly about uh, 40, 50 years from 1700 to 1740 or 1750s as some other critics may say. Neoclassicism gives importance to respect for ancient Greek and Roman authors. A classic is defined as an example of excellence. So, literature was considered primarily as an art, an artifice. These neoclassical authors honed their skills by study and practice to achieve specific artistic purposes in their writings. Two key texts were used by many of these authors. One is Horace's Arts Poetica and the other is Aristotle's Poetics. We can notice three key principles of this neoclassicism. One is wit, second is rationality and the third is decorum. Wit means ingenuity, intelligence, acuteness of the mind or sharpness of the mind, rationality refers to use of reason and decorum is actually an elegant harmony of style and content. In this period, wit was given so much importance. An accomplished writer is known for his genuine true wit. So, Pope defines true wit in his poem an essay on criticism. True wit is nature to advantage rest, what of was thought, but never so well expressed. Probably this is the basic idea of this communication. Whoever is able to communicate well is 
a fantastic uh, person, but then we often think, but do not express so well. So, the ability to express what we think clearly and express clearly the same thought very clearly to others is considered to be the mark of wit or mark of genius. There are certain features of neoclassical poetry, if we remember them that will be useful for us. In this period, poetry was considered an imitation of life, a mirror held up to nature. The purpose of poetry was considered to be giving instruction and also aesthetic pleasure. This period marked rhetorical features like paradox, antithesis, anaphora, tricolon, lightetes or hyperbole. We have an example of this tricolon here. This is from epistle to Dr. Abathnot. We will study this also in this course. Poor Connor sees his frantic wife elope and curses wit and poetry and pope. What does pope have to do with the elopement of a wife of a person called Connus? Pope is unable to understand, but pope is held responsible for everything. So, he writes like this. The new classical humanistic ideal was to give fresh and exquisite expression to common human experiences and uphold truth. At the same time, these authors understood that there were limits to humanity. Hence, they used satire to attack or dress down human weaknesses, particularly focusing on the pride of the ego of individuals, which actually enabled people to quarrel with each other. The Augustan mode has been studied by many critics. Here is one Cohen who has given certain features of this Augustan mode. It will be good to remember many of these features as we study the neoclassical poems. Satire and Georgic descriptive poem were the two kinds of poetry in the Augustan mode. The composition of poetry was done mainly through accretion that is addition or accumulation again revisions as additions primarily by observation. Augustan mode had this prospect views from a vantage point you look at certain things and describe and Augustan mode also encouraged the use of spatial imagery moving from high to low or from side to side and many figures of extension that is rhetorical figures were used in this kind of Augustan mode. Poets used the organizational strategy with varied tones, different kinds of speakers and poetic features plus political and social attitudes. They were attempting to give different perspectives on the same problem. They were also using certain principles of modification when it comes to language in terms of adjectives, adverbial words, phrases and clauses two primary forms of poetry in this period were one heroic couplet and blank verse. It means we have to understand that blank verse which, which was started in Elizabethan period continued, but heroic couplet happened to be the very predominant form. Most of these authors were concerned with man, nature and God and also the kind of limited knowledge that they were aware of. Finally, as we noted earlier, the art form of this period is imitation. So, we have this idea of the art of imitative imagination, which is not exactly equal to real life. That is where pre romantic poetry came into picture to touch upon real life situations. It is surprising to see that there are many poets, but the chief position of Alexander Pope can be easily understood. Look at any uh, anthology or look at any history of English poetry, you will find not many poets during this period writing uh, using this Augustan mode. They will be involved in many other kinds, but it, when it comes to poetry, it is difficult to see. Even Jonathan Swift is primarily known as a novelist. John Gay is more of a dramatist. He used songs in his drama, The Beggar's Opera. Samuel Johnson is a poet, but he is known primarily for his criticism and dictionary and all other poets 
or quite surprisingly women that we have noted and French Elizabeth Thomas, Lady Mary Montague who is this Lady Mary Montague was incidentally a friend of Alexander Pope later on she became an enemy of Pope. So, we will find Pope attacking Lady Mary Montague in his uh, epistle to Dr. Abathnath. The last one is Mary Leper who is from a lower class society background, but she was equally popular during this period. We also have some representative poems, one from Swift, a description of a city shower, Thomas Gay's uh, poem Trivia or the art of walking the streets of London, Pope of course, number of poems we have just we have mentioned two here, both of them are mock heroic poems and uh, in addition to epistle to Dr. Abathnath that is the rape of the lock and the danciad. The rape of the lock is considered to be the best mock epic poem in English. We also have Johnson's poem, well known poem, The Vanity of Human Wishes and of course, we have London by Johnson. We have a sample poem from Pope for us, it deals with man, God, everything. This particular essay, he deals with the question of man. Here it goes. Know then thyself, presume not God to scan, the proper study of mankind is man. Placed on this isthmus of a middle state, a being darkly wise and rudely great, with too much knowledge for the skeptic side, with too much weakness for the strikes pride. He hang between, in doubt to act or rest, in doubt to deem himself a god or beast, in doubt his mind or body to prefer, born but to die and reasoning but to err. We continue, alike in ignorance his reason such, whether he thinks too little or too much, chaos of thought and passion all confused, still by himself abused or disabused, created have to rise and have to fall, great lord of all things, yet a prey to all, sole judge of truth, in endless error hurled, the glory, jest and riddle of the world. This is what Pope has conceived of human beings in his essay on man. All these ideas are beautifully captured in half line by Robert F. Browning and thus we half men struggle. And this idea, very idea is again dramatized by this Indian dramatist Grish Karnad in Hayavadana. Half men, we half men struggle. From here we move to pre-romanticism or pre-romantic period starting from 1740 ending in 1798. The dates vary from accounts to account, but we will follow one order. In this period we find this fall of Robert Walpole considered to be the first Prime Minister of England, he fell out of favour in 1742, not because of corruption though he was known for corruption, but because of his unwillingness to wage war. Then we find uh, William Pitt the elder coming in in the place of Robert Walpole based on the idea of uh, patriotism and then we have this King George III during this period from 1760 to 1820. At this time we notice that Britain was emerging as a colonial power. This colonial power was strengthened with this treaty or the peace treaty known as the Peace of Paris signed in 1763 and this meant Britain could rule Canada and India. And because of this colonial activities and trade with many other countries, wealth was flowing into the country, but this wealth was not equally distributed that led to social unrest, political unrest in England leading to one great riot known as the Gordon Riots in 1780. There was a huge chaos and mob rule was there in London for some time. This kind of unrest is reflected in other places like France where we have this French revolution, in America where we have this uh, American revolution and during this time we find a number of writers coming from this middle class and also rural areas. Certain features of pre-romantic poetry are listed here for us to understand the writers that we are going to discuss. This is generally known as a transitional movement from the 1740s to the romantic period. These writers said goodbye to 
wit, satire and humor. That does not mean that they do not have intelligence, but they do use it in imaginative way. There is a shift towards simple, sincere and natural way of life, not artificial way of life as was seen in restoration and neoclassical period. In political terms, it meant a projection of different kind of values away from this aristocratic society to middle class values. Philosophically, we find Rousseau's influence in this period with his interest in imagination, innocence and childhood. It meant to express emotions freely rather than with control as neoclassicists did. It means simply to follow the heart and not the mind. These writers were open to the beauties of nature, not just classical books or nature as described in the books, classical books particularly. For pre-romantic poets, the sites of poetry were the garden, the graveyard and nature. You may recall Andrew Morrill has a poem called The Garden and many other writers were now and then writing, but because of this power of new neoclassicism or restoration that was not given that much importance. The terminological problem of pre-romantic or post-Augustan was discussed by Northrop Frye and he came out with a new alternative that is the age of sensibility because of this interest in emotion or feeling of many writers. As opposed to neoclassical period, we find a large number of pre-romantic poets unless we pay special attention like this, neoclassical period means only Dryden, Johnson and Pope. But remember, we have a large number of poets, we have listed only a few, Edward Young, James Thompson, Thomas Gray, Oliver Goldsmith, William Cooper, William Collins, Thomas Chatterton, George Grabb. Uh, William Blake, Robert Burns, the writers highlighted like Thomas Gray, William Collins and William Blake we will discuss in this course. We have two quotations here, very interesting ones indicating the shift towards uh, nature or romantic period. Now rural sites alone, but rural sounds. The second sentence is interesting, please find out check and find out the source of these two sentences that is an interesting exercise for you. God made the country and man made the town. We have a number of representative poems from these poets and many others like uh, the seasons from Thompson, uh, night piece on death by Parnell, uh, night thoughts by Edward Young, the grey by Robert Blair, Mark Akenside. The title itself is very interesting, the pleasures of imagination. Thomas Gray who is known for this elegy written in a country churchyard, Collins O to Evening, Burns a red, red rose, Goldsmith the deserted village, John Clare Autumn and lastly Blake. Among many other poems we have just mentioned songs of innocence and experience. As we said earlier a number of pre-romantic poets are there, but these poets do not get that much importance because of this brilliance of Dryden and uh, of course Pope. One particular critic called Branson has identified one key feature of each of these poets. It is very interesting to see Thompson is characterized by spaciousness, Collins by incorporeality, the Wattens two brothers actually James and Thompson Watton uh, by partisanship, Young by commiseration, Akenside by reasonableness. Robert Burns by pride and passion, Churchill unmannerliness, Thomas Gray by eclecticism, Smart by enthusiasm, Shenstone by placidity, Macpherson by rant, Goldsmith by amenity, Chatterton by atavism, Cooper by humanity, Grab by sobriety and finally William Blake by extravagance, extravagance of imagination. Blake is not really a pre-romantic poet, though he was considered to be so, he is actually now considered to be proper romantic poet, but for the sake of discussion, for the sake of accommodating him, we have brought him here. We have a sample poem by William Cooper, this is called The Task. There are three books, the first book is called The Sofa, here we have some lines. Nor less composure waits upon the roar of distant floods or on the softer voice of neighboring fountain or of rills that slip 
through that cleft rock and chiming as they fall upon the pebbles lose themselves at length in matter grass that with a livelier green betrays a secret of their silent course nature inanimate employs sweet sounds but animated nature sweeter still to soothe and satisfy the human ear we can see the crux of this movement from neoclassical to pre romantic with these two words nature inanimate to animated nature nature becomes alive in the poetry of pre romantics and later romantic poets as we indicated earlier we have a tabular comparison restoration period neoclassical period and pre romantic period represented by three different uh, three different groups of poets dryden rochester pope johnson gray collins blake these three periods focus on certain key art forms like public satire personal satire and melancholy in these three different periods uh, heroic couplet in restoration period heroic couplet in neoclassical period but distinctly blank verse in pre romantic period similarly we have public criticism and private criticism in these uh, two periods known as restoration and neoclassical whereas there is no criticism of anything but reflection meditation in pre romantic periods further we have notion of correctness in restoration and elegance neoclassical period and vision in pre romantic period further we notice certain key features like antithesis being dominant in restoration along with antithesis wit being much more serious in neoclassical period and finally metaphor or sight related to vision connecting different thoughts in uh, pre romantic period three key texts that we have chosen to represent these three periods mac flecknow for restoration epistle to dr abathnot for neoclassical period and william collins o to evening for pre romantic period now let's summarize this vast period of neoclassical age from 1660 to 1798 with the three distinct stages called restoration neoclassicism and pre romantic period although we have this te terminological problems and uses of these terms we still use them for convenience restoration period is represented by rochester and dryden similarly neoclassical period is represented by pope and dr johnson and the third one pre romantic period we represent it by gray and collins although dr johnson can be equally brought in here with that name age of sensibility or age of dr johnson we observed several features of these different stages of neoclassical period and had uh, representative poets and poems and also we looked at three samples of uh, these three different stages of neoclassical period to understand how all are similar at the same time how one is different from another we finally uh, showed this uh, tabular comparison to understand all these features much better and to indicate the next uh, period that is romantic period we have a quotation from blake's poem the marriage of heaven and hell and this actually characterizes i think all human beings of all ages without contraries is no progression opposition is true friendship if you want to explore these topics in more detail please refer to these articles i found them useful i believe you will also find them extremely useful to you thank you